Evening all on PlayChess, also streaming to YouTube. Okay, I also, this is the King's Crusher radio show. This is actually a Wednesday, which is rare. It's usually on Tuesday, UK time about eight o'clock PM. Uh, so we're gonna carry on looking at Fisher at the Palmer de Mallorca Interzonal 1970. Uh, so we've already had three parts which are available on my YouTube channel uh, youtube.com slash Kings Crusher uh, so this fourth part will continue looking at now his 12th round game and Fisher was black playing black against F. M. Geller who was actually a player who did actually beat Fisher quite a few times it was actually one of uh, Fisher's most successful Russian opponents, uh, well, ex USSR opponents. Uh, so, Geller actually, I think he was also a trainer of Karpov, but uh, yeah, I think Wiki's very good for information about players, so check him out. But he's a very great player, Geller. Uh, so, let's have a look at this game. Uh, he might have been quite fearful of Fisher because apparently there was um, an early draw offer in this game. I think within the first 10 moves there was a draw offer. It started with knight f3, uh, so the Resi opening. So unassuming, knight f6, and now c4 was played. Fisher played g6, and we have g3, so it could go into a King's Engine Fianchetto variation. So bishop g7, bishop g2, both sides castle. <clears throat> but here now, instead of d6, you might think King's Engine Fincetto variation. Actually, Fisher adopted a more solid looking setup, but kind of less dynamic in some ways. He actually played c6 here. Uh, I wonder in Livebook if that's quite popular. I'll just check Livebook here. Uh, usually, d6 is the most common move, actually. So it's quite interesting c6 being played. Uh, there's over like three, three and a half thousand games with d6, just Fincetto King's Engine variation. c5 also a bit popular, 900 games. d5 about 865, but c6, yeah, it's, it is it is quite popular as well, but um, it's an altogether different personality to d6. So black is going solid in the center, central occupation. Uh, we see d4, d5, and here, uh, white took on d5. This is actually the main move. Now, usually players with white play, apparently knight c3 is quite popular, uh, keeping the pressure on d5. Instead, we see knight e5, uh, second most used move. And usually players with black actually play e6 in this position, believe it or not, it only shuts in that bishop, but it seems to be the most popular move. Fisher's move flies against that. He's, there's only 15 games in live book with what Fisher played here. So I wonder, is, is there some issue with it? It's not very popular, but bishop f5. You you might think, why, why isn't this popular? It keeps the bishop aggressive looking. It might actually be threatening bishop e4. Let's put on a kibitza here as well. Uh, so if black's given a chance, well, maybe that's not a big deal, bishop e4, maybe just putting pressure on the center, queen b6, or knight c6, I think that wants to put pressure on this knight and the pawn. Um, so, okay, so bishop f5 being played here. White plays now knight c3. And it looks as though actually the, a possible downside of bishop f5 is b7. So queen b3 might be more dangerous than usual here uh, in this position, targeting d5 and b7. Okay, so we see now black actually, again, it seems you know, quite, quite uh, an interesting idea. Black actually played knight e4 funny enough uh, so one question how does it address actually a, a move like queen b3 is that any good or well, maybe on queen b3 
um, here this position I mean Queen b3 wasn't actually played by the way Bishop e3 was played but let's have a quick look at Queen b3 uh, Knight c6 and yeah maybe this is you know, awkward with d4 here uh, if the Queen takes here Knight takes c3 takes this might be okay for black apparently this is okay for black this this kind of position if you look at this yeah the bishop looks absolutely great here actually so interesting idea knight e4 another another thought um, by the way hi hi all on on stream another thought which occurs here is um what about say just taking is, is that a move just taking um bishop takes I guess it doesn't matter about the double pawns here. Uh, with queen d5, yeah, that, that could be fun maybe coming up. Maybe with knight c6. So, okay, bishop e3 was played. Not testing this queen b3 business. And Fisher just took on c3. And white took on c3. And it seems perfectly reasonable for black, this position. It seems as though potentially there's a backward pawn here to torture, or maybe even a blockade square one day. Maybe knight a5, and we're looking at a juicy c4 square with a backward pawn. So you know, things could get very exciting here. <laughs> it's not the most exciting pawn structure, actually. Uh, for some reason, I, f I feel a bit sleepy when looking at pawn structures generally, but there is an imbalance, actually. There is an imbalance. It's just the d5 personality is, is very different to the d6. This looks a lot more solid than black. And, you know, the bishop does a fine job, actually, of cutting out any rook b1. So this pawn's not fearing any rook b1 here. Um, so white took. I think, yeah, the, the opponent was, was content with a draw, maybe scared of Fisher. I think the draw offer had occurred within the first few moves. And, um, you know, Fisher had declined it. But here, white's not you know that ambitious here. Um, so queen a4, and if anything, now I mean black's almost totally equalised here. So I guess you can consider this a great success. So at move 13, queen b6. You know this this is nice. Uh, this this is nice. Uh, black could even control this b file if that's worth anything. Um, you know some exploitable targets on the, on the second rank so we see rook ac1 black from an engine point of view black is doing great here almost a tiny advantage for black and here uh white sh maybe should keep solid uh there's there's different ways of keeping solid maybe just bishop f4 return the compliment trying to control b8 if white controls b1 and it's actually if you look at it if that was played yeah we've got perfect symmetry haven't we We've got almost the perfect symmetry. Yeah, it looks as though this should be drawn. It looks absolutely dead, stone cold draw. So funny enough, White, by not playing this, actually he creates an imbalance now in the position. And he didn't need to. Couldn't he have just played bishop f4? White actually now ventured <laughs> c4. It looks kind of logical to attack Black's pawn chain, putting it under greater scrutiny. D4 is a bit loose though, and in fact Fisher just snaps off on D4. So what's White's idea here? Isn't this a bit silly? White's actually, actually going into uh, what seems to be uh, maybe a, a spot of bother here. His pawns pinned at the moment. He plays now. Uh, he doesn't play what the engine continues is as dead equal with Rook FD1. Apparently this should be dead equal. For example, here, C takes, and another dry position with totally symmetrical pawn structure. Um, this didn't happen. No, um, White actually played now this move E3. So Fisher's technically a pawn up against Geller. Uh, so what's the idea? Queen E5 doesn't matter about A7. Any ta any capture on A7. You know, we get this pawn back, surely. White took on d5, took rook here. He's got a bit of pressure, but he's a pawn down. This is just supported. 
So he temporarily equalizes on pawns, but now rook a8 is going to pick up the a2 pawn. And maybe the intention here was just to draw this position a pawn down. If black steps away from the center with the queen, then it actually, I mean, immediately there'll be like horrible things actually, not just e4 here, but um, g4 actually traps the bishop, doesn't it? Nearly. Because uh, we can't we can't actually play um, bishop e4. We got this pin against the queen. Uh, so the only thing here would be e5, and this this is actually is not good because then we're on the rook of the queen takes. So that's a way for black to lose. Um, so Fisher's in this position. So it's like a, a statement that's being made here by Geller that I'm going to draw this position a pawn down. It's just, you know, all rook and pawn endings are drawn, aren't they? After all. It's interesting. It's interesting. Um, Fisher, yeah, he can't step away. I mean, if he steps here, let's have a quick look at this. Again, g4 is a nuisance. This bishop is, you know, blocked in by its own pawn chain. Um, on bishop e4, there's f3. And then black would have to give up the bishop. Um, e5, queen d2, the bishop's stranded. So yeah, really, Fisher has to accept the queen's coming off. He does take on d4, and white takes on d4, and black's still a pawn up, but it's simplified. So let's take a poll here. Um, do you do you think black should be able to win this? Uh, if I give you twenty seconds, should should black be able to win this? That's that's my poll question here. If I give you twenty seconds and have some tea while waiting. So this is the position. Fisher's won a pawn. White has played very strangely. Started off unambitiously, then deliberately goes like a pawn down when he could have had a perfectly symmetrical position if he had just played bishop f4. So what do you guys think? Should black be able to win this? There's no outside pass pawn, is there? What does that mean? There's no outside pass pawn. Does that reduce the winning chances? Pawns are all on the same sides. Bishops are the same color. Okay, so Fisher's playing black. So dead, dead in the end, the observer on play chess. Yeah, Fisher's playing black, black against Geller. Okay, let's see what happened here. The engine thinks it's, it is like a solid pawn up. 1.16 is, is given. With white's best move apparently being g4 here, and maybe the second best being e4. Well, let's see what happened. e4. And now the pair of bishops come off, so we have a raw rook and pawn ending. If Fisher refuses this bishop exchange, I mean, say he plays something like this. He could play this. This is, this is plausible, actually. Bishop h3 is plausible. Uh, he can't do much else here. I think we run into uh, potentially this, but apparently not. Maybe just rook c7. Okay, but he takes he takes the bishop off and prepares to double rooks now on f2. So we see rook e3, and white is preparing to put pressure on f7 and defend f2. So white's plan is surely he can he can save this position with rook pressure now we see this move g5 which indicates the king is willing maybe to step up soon h3 king comes up and now here king g6 rook f3 f6 defending f7 rook e7 uh, there might be a temptation to play e5 here this wasn't played actually fisher played rook e2 Let's have a quick look at e5. e5 would allow rook e6, so precision is needed. Um, because here, if rook f8, then there's rook takes e5 using the pin. So Fisher's move is more seems much better. In this position, rook e2 uh, to defend. Okay. Yeah, because e5 there's rook e6, and we see g4 now. 
and it takes away these squares from the king. So actually, if the rooks swing back, there's a potential mating net for the black king. We see check, and now a potential mating net for the white king. So things are hotting up. There's a force like mating, whatever, being threatened, the mating three being threatened by black. So white plays now rook a3, which gives the king f3. We see h5, trying to weaken these pawns. Uh, if white took this pawn here, by the way, um, whoops. Sorry, after h5, white played this, right, threatening um, this, this mate in free here against the black king. Um, if this, let's have a quick look at that, then this, this is okay for black. This it seems to be as though black's made some sort of progress there with the pawn split. So yeah, Gillett actually goes for this. And then we see check. And now this king needs f5. So hg, hg, check. And now giving the king f5 to escape with rook takes g4, right, to defend against this. So we have this swap of pawns. So is this position a slight improvement on earlier? Rook b1. So there's always rook f4 now to defend f6, it seems. And that's tested. Then rook a2. Rook h1, as though black's testing white now slightly. What is he going to do? In fact, there's an immediate threat of rook takes f2 check, and then rook h2 check to pick up that rook. First little tactical test. Well, another one, rather. Rook, the rooks protect each other against this. So they're pretty safe. Rook b4, what does this mean? Well, it means maybe um, the rooks are going to join each other there. Rook here. Fisher doesn't want to exchange off rooks. He keeps the rooks on. So two pairs of rooks. Uh, now, yeah, it looks pretty jawish. Rook b5. Uh, here, it looks as though rook f5 check could could be uh, the start of something useful here, with the king potentially being kicked around uh, or put in danger. We see this challenging rook f5 check to stop that. Check, a bit of teasing, rook bb1, rook a8. Now the king steps out here. Interestingly, I think the engine point of view. Well, let's have a look. Uh, check, king goes. Sorry, check, king goes there. Check, king h5. Check, king g6. What progress has been made? Check, king f7. The king's gone all the way back. And now white king is is checked. Rook e5. So this actually secures f5 without the checks from a5. Rook d2. Was white actually being threatened by anything? Well, may, maybe rook f5 is a concern for f2. Okay, so rook d2 adds support for f2. Check, check. And now we see king g6. Rook e4. So this is at move 57. Check. Rook a5. And it looks as though black might actually be potentially playing g4 at some point. Rook e3. King h5. Uh, where is the king going? Uh, this time round, if a check here, there appears to be king g4. And then, for example, like this, it seems as though black's getting a squeeze uh, in play. So white didn't play that check. White played this one. Rook a, a1. No, no immediate threat, apart from g4 to gain a bit of space, maybe to, to make these pawns a little bit more dangerous. Rook d8, f5. So the pawns are starting to roll forward a little bit now. At move 61. King f3, check. Here, check. The pawns are rolling forward. Uh, the king, correctly it seems, went to f4. This seems correct. The evaluation here uh, at move 64. Uh, is 0 0.03, so at move 64 with king f4, it's the engine sees nothing here, um, actually. And also, uh, it seems as though white might be threatening, well, white's on the rook. And, you know, say, say, say the rook moved away, 
then king takes f5 say say the rook protected um with that this is a forced mate in eight this this would actually be a forced mate in eight after rook three d6 uh the white king is actually being mated here uh believe it or not and it's a forced mate in seven <laughs> Uh, so this has to be avoided uh, does anyone want a proof of that sorry that Fisher had to take the rook here it seems well another move it seems poss possible is g3 but if he plays this um, does anyone want me to show that that rook a5 I, I will just just briefly okay hold on a sec just for the record uh, apparently say, say here this is a mating two with check yeah this, yeah you see that the king's kind of stranded right so fisher takes off this rook so there's really nothing in the game it seems this is at move 65 engine evaluation is 0 0.02 uh, fisher plays rook f1 and now here apparently uh there's a move which should should be comfortable enough king g3 where it seems to be of there's no major problem here uh, the only plan that black seems to have is king here and f4 let's, let's just try this if king here apparently white could play f3 so if f4 check king here this should be okay for white okay but um in the game white played rook d2 it's not it's still it still should be fine uh, we see king h4 and even this next move which equalizes on pawns should be zero zero this should be absolutely zero apparently unless stockfish has, has had a breakdown here and i need a table base this position here at move 67 is zero 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 uh, even with fisher's move g3 which seems to you know be quite dangerous for the pin and white again played what seems to be good move f4 uh, again equal move king h3 was played and this pawn is not going to go anywhere if it's pinned it is actually pinned there's two moves which are apparently both dead equal rook d3 pinning the pawn on rook d8 rook d3 is played fisher plays king h4 rook d2 again so what on earth can go wrong here rook a1 is now played and what is the point of rook a1 well it, it seems to be implying something um sinister or is it uh, like a check here and something but uh, on move 71 um it appears to be the case that uh king king g6 should be okay for white uh rook d7 should be okay for white you know maybe this idea or rook d8 in fact there's there's a few moves which seem from an engine point of view totally um e equal here in fact i wonder if there's any others well there's there's three for you but uh, in the game we actually see uh, a different move here uh, we see the move king e5 and this is the probably this is appears to be a losing move actually king e5 uh, it's all of a sudden it's gone plus nine in black's favor after this move played by Geller um what's what's the problem with it let's see well the problem there's a kind of weakness of the last move I, I guess you can say that it's actually taking control of that critical g4 square because now fisher can actually park his king on g4 and he's also um it also means that rookie one check is threatening to actually take that pawn uh this this pawn seems to be in big danger actually now uh so if yeah if the king hadn't moved to e5 
you know, rook d8, you know, how, how will black be making progress? If here, uh, rook g8, say this, then we've got perpetual check, haven't we? Or not? Hang on, the king goes here. What we can do here is rook takes g2, and this is a drawn position, apparently. It's drawn. Unless the engine is telling lies, if this this is a drawn position to, to reach. Okay, m maybe not that simple. I mean, if Geller gets it wrong, what hope is for us mere mortals? He's a top Soviet grandmaster. He got it wrong. He played king e5. Yeah, so there's there's moves to to prepare, I guess, to sacrifice the rook with these checks, and then this f pawn should draw after. But he plays king e5. So this king g4, f5, and now Fisher plays check. Geller resigns. He resigns here. Uh, this looks lost now, because uh, if say king e4, we just take this pawn, and it's it's pretty trivial actually with the king cut from this f file. Uh, whatever you know, White can't actually save this now. For example, okay, we we keep the king cut. And we're just going to play, um, I think, like this. So let's say like this, g2, check, check. I think I'm going to run out of checks here. Uh, we, we go like that, for example, and we're queening the pawn. So this game kind of, um, maybe may, it's a, one of Fisher's dullest grinds in the entire interzonal of 1970. And it's the prelude to the next game, which I think is one of the more exciting wins of Fisher, which I'm about to show you in the next game. Oh, oh dear, did I just give a spoiler alert? Oh, blame me. Sorry, I mean, no, I mean, he might have won the next game. <laughs> it was exciting. I mean, was, the next game is interesting as well. That's what I mean. <laughs> Ah, okay, so yeah, uh, King e5, and and Geller had to resign shortly after this King e5. This horrific blunder, it seems, in a simple position, loses yeah, to King g4. This is kind of weakness of the last move, being pounced on. Okay, so let's go on to the next game. Um, so just in a nutshell, though, it, did, it was a very, very dull setup from Fischer, and he was up for a grind from it. it was up, he was up for a grind, especially as though White thought he could just easily secure the draw, a pawn down. It wasn't to be. It was just a total grind in this rook and pawn ending. Yeah. So, determination. Okay. All right. So, uh, the next game against Borislav Ivkov, um, who I think... I was checking him out. He beat Fischer in the Keras defense five years earlier to this game. Quite a dangerous opponent in his own right. Um, Fischer was playing white and played e4. So Borislav Ivkov played e5. So we see classic Roy Lopez. Bishop a4, knight f6. Castles, bishop e7. Rook e1. Uh, it's all pretty standard Roy Lopez territory. Yeah, d6. Actually, this is the most popular move here. So, um, c3, most popular. This is the most beaten path. Um, now, h6 is um, the, the stats here for those interested in Roy Lopez, by the way. Knight a5 is the most common move, over 6,000 games, followed by bishop b7, about 4,000 games. Knight b8, I think Magnus Coulson's used that a bit. Bray or something? Brea? And there's, uh, that's like 3,000. There's rook eight. There's lot, all sorts of possibilities for this junction. But uh, h6 was chosen by Ivkov, uh, which is also popular. d4. And black plays rook e8. Uh, black strategy is still very well laid out. Usually, um, the move played here is knight bd2 uh, 451 games fisher varies now gets out of the book quite a lot with this next move bishop e3 uh this this pawn isn't really hanging 
uh, if knight takes e4 bishop d5 um yeah that's that's pretty embarrassing so um players with black yeah bishop f8 is usually played and now fisher protects the pawn bishop b7 queen b1 and a lot odd looking move actually queen b8 uh looks slightly odd to mirror the queen here uh so what's going on here where is this queen going <laughs> uh okay so a3 is played knight d8 some closed maneuvering bishop c2 fisher is strengthening e4 quite drastically even with this battery he's got a lot of protection of e4 here and is there a concrete threat or anything well maybe a4 to weaken the structure here black actually plays c6 and we see fisher fixing a bit these pawns now with this move b4 as though to try and discourage c5 uh, we see queen c7 and now bishop d3 so not just holding the center more comfortably with the bishops but also this bishop eyes b5 so maybe in the future a4 and c4 and you know you never know if you play both a4 and c4 then later on you know if black ever took here you never know this might be a weakling this a6 pawn to pick on uh, so we see knight e6 as though knight f4 might be good to get rid of white's dark square bishop uh, queen c2 so what is fisher up to well queen c2 it looks as though staring the queen indirectly an x-ray as though c4 would have a bit more punch to it you know c takes later we've got that pin on the queen so it looks as though c4 is being prepared for at the right moment rook a c8 and here it looks as though black might be interested at some point in c5 um not here um well or maybe maybe but white discourages it with the timely move a4 uh, so question number one is c5 out of out of question let's have a quick look here it seems d5 it would shut down the bishop uh and apparently this this is good for white um if the knight goes back this this looks miserable a takes and we're winning that pawn and we're actually on the rook actually um so, you know that that's not pleasant no so black here okay he's under a bit of positional pressure he plays knight d7 and then we see another little shuffling move queen b3 looks to be eyeing this potentially useful diagonal also getting out of the way if black was interested in c5 c5 again seems unplayable here at this moment these bishops seem to be comfortably controlling the central squares and we see black actually now playing something which seems quite committal actually black actually played uh well this knight it seems to be on the verge of being pushed back maybe with d5 queen b3 supports d5 pardon me it's not just about eyeing the diagonal <laughs> d5 is actually supported by queen b3 uh let, let's just test that sorry let's let's just see if that really has got substance i'm going to do a token move to analyze it okay if d5 is a positional threat here let's i mean let's try and do a token move let's let's say i mean this move uh, d5 yeah where where's not like needs d8 yeah so um let's not test it with that move okay rookie eight can we play d5 here if the knight went back there d takes takes we can fracture the pawn structure uh, we've got a target here and actually f5 is also a bit weak so maybe knight h4 and actually that pin is actually useful here because any g6 we've got knight g6 
so this looks good to try and get the knight to f5 this position okay i just wanted to determine something if d5 was a, a faint threat here uh, it seems because this move is quite radical black actually played knight f4 it's radical because okay it gets rid of the dark square bishop but we're talking about potentially weak pawn on f4 later if white takes and he did take so e takes f4 so what do you think about this do you think white should be better here what's what's your evaluation if i give you 20 seconds here do you think white should be better this this looked like a committal decision that's why i wanted to test d5 might have been in response to that potential threat has white gains a small advantage here what 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 do you think Uh, would would you prefer white here? Small advantage to white. <clears throat> hmm. What's Black's idea of these doubling doubling the pawns? Like double the pawns. I mean, potentially this dark square bishop could be great later in theory. At the moment, it just seems cramped though. This dark square bishop. Why well, hasn't got the dark square bishop? Yeah, g5. I was just wondering. About. I mean, that would be weakening this diagonal a lot if Black wants to continue with g5. Fisher's energetic here. He plays c4. Uh, just just for sake of argument okay let's go crazy here with this 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 crazy looking plan black actually played b takes c4 let's go with g5 for a moment is that terrible yes there's a meltdown on the queen side which i don't think can be tolerated okay so black's got to do something about this um so he can't play energetically with the bishop uh he takes on c4 uh, bishop takes c4 but he uses the bishop on this diagonal by playing d5 so he's putting pressure on b4 however uh, this structure it looks as if on a6 one day white doesn't need to play e takes that would simplify here if e takes i think this would be a mistake actually black could play rook takes and it seems this this position is technically uh, absolutely fine for black this position here the bishop's actually quite good isn't it and also black's got that c file so fisher can't do this he he wants this pawn to lock in the queen and rook it's a backward pawn which should be a source of great misery for black if kept there and tortured so we see this little retreat move bishop d3 keeping black's position under lock and key uh, so yeah backward pawns can sometimes spell misery we see rook b8 as though there's a downside to this this b pawn isn't is not not too good queen c3 stepping out of uh, the rook queen b6 so b4 being looked at rook e b1 so it's keeping a lock down on c5 which hems in the bishop bishop a8 it's a miserable bishop on a8 that's for sure it's like a not very nice um, and in fact a5 keeping black in prison in this pawn structure queen a7 uh, and now we see e5 uh, it looks as though white's advantage uh, is increasing here um, yeah we see rook b7 as though is is this on the cards to try and uh what is it what is black up to here uh is is he even i mean is this even an idea i don't really know what black's up to it, it seems locked down here and he's actually given up this pawn he's trying to give up this pawn that's what he's up to why did he do that i mean what what else does black do say black doesn't offer the c6 pawn let's say queen b7 Uh, let's go with rook a4 let's have a look at this position i think this is just comfortable it's 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 just miserable for black so black wanted to do something active you know he he, he tries to offer this pawn sack 
And you know, th does Fisher want to take it? And what about the B4 pawn? The thing is, this pawn is actually a good access to A6. Um, so yeah, is this terrifying now that Black, a very strong player, say you were playing him, he's beaten you quite convincingly five years ago. He's offering the C6 pawn. Can you honestly say you would take the C6 pawn here? Would you consider this some sort of blunder? How many of you would take on C6 here? Well, it's not, it's not that interesting, I think, to ask. So yeah, Fisher took the C6 pawn and it's a trade of a week, one weakness for the other, but it seems to be liberating the bishop a little bit. It's still behind the D5 pawn. It needs some wriggling to get out to be useful later. Bishop takes B4, but Queen takes A6 and we've got, you know, an extra pawn. Queen B8. Uh, potentially now, Rook E6 is on the cards uh, to embarrass the Queen. One move gets, gives the Queen a rear, rear drive. Bishop C2. Okay, so keeps an eye on B1 and the Queen's given this diagonal to bounce around. Rook E6 and we see this. Queen D3. Queen D3. So we've got this one threatened. Knight f8 defending. And now this f pawn is a target. So we're going from this one to this one now. Queen f5. Forget about the past pawn. That's a good asset though. Uh, we see that being picked on the a pawn. Uh, knight b3 protecting the a pawn. This bishop still, all the meanwhile, in prison a little bit with this. You know, it's not as bad as before, but black has gone a pawn down for this. Is it really worth it? We see g6. Queen takes f4, so two pawns down. But after bishop c3, uh, white has to be uh, careful, surely, here. Uh, Fisher actually played knight c5 and let's look at that position. So this move bishop b4 did release control, weakness of the last move, did release control of the c5 square so that's tapped into. If the rook had routinely moved here, let's have a look at this. If say rook a2, I think this is okay actually there's nothing terrible going wrong here. It's It's actually okay. I mean, bishop takes a5, it doesn't matter. We can do this. We, we can counterattack there. So black's actually in a bad way, actually, if there's no real penalty. Uh, but knight c5 is apparently one of the strongest moves, not moving the rook to either here or here. The engine prefers Fisher's move, stockfish, prefers Fisher's move, which is actually knight c5. It looks like a great square for the knight. Um, and now black is in a bad state. He played rook takes a5 here. Okay, that gets the pawn back. Uh, if if bishop takes, um, then rook takes a1 is, is apparently the best. So we've got these guys forks. And we're going to get our exchange back. Or are we? No, we're not. Yes, we are. Because knight takes hits the queen. Doesn't matter about that. We're hitting the queen. Uh, this this would be better for white. This position here is better for white. Um, so okay, so knight c5, yeah, active move. It's got a nice root here. Uh, we see rook takes a5. Um, now possibly best actually was bishop takes a1 apparently, but rook takes a5. Knight takes b7. Rook takes. Rook takes, and here knight e6 hitting the queen. It's all getting a bit tactical. The queen goes to f6 now, uh, so keeping an eye on this pawn structure around the poor king. Uh, bishop takes a1, knight d6 now hitting f7. Black needs to defend f7. He plays queen c7. So Fisher, after all that, is one pawn up. Um, but these bishops are a bit odd on a8 and a1 here. I mean, this one's hemmed in 
with the d5 pawn this one's kind of needs some work as well to get back in the game and actually it's black's king which is facing an onslaught now uh, because Fisher actually plays well so I've given a bit of a clue here what would you play with white if I give you 20 seconds here white to play it looks kind of um, as though you why wouldn't you play this so white to play here kind of shreds black's king to bits that's a bit of a clue what would you play as white Um, so white to play, any ideas? Yeah. Actually, um, the continuation is amazing on this. Uh, so it's not just the move. You know why I ask these guess the moves? It's actually the continuation of reasoning behind them that distinguishes the amazing players from everyone else. It's the continuation here. Uh, so bishop takes g6. And you might think... Um, okay that was easy but you've got to factor in queen c1 check uh, so here what would you play with white in this position uh, but okay before we go on i mean if we if we take here i mean it's a disaster we can actually just take here for example and then take here fantastic at minimum so you know black plays queen c1 check but what do you play here with white in this position? I think this is a harder question. Uh, to, to answer. Now, this check needs to be factored in. That's why I'm saying the continuations are amazing. So the check. What do you play here? Twenty seconds. Um, I hope this is caught up with you. This position, nearly. <clears> hmm. <throat> yeah. Hmm. Any ideas? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Actually, White is in a great position, and and one observer on play chess has indicated that uh, King H2 should be enough. In fact, yeah, I think King H2 is enough, but Knight E1 is a forced mate in nine actually, for Black. If you played Knight E1, it's taking the Queen away from uh, the Queen F4 check. This move, which wasn't played, uh, would allow Black to play on a few more moves with the check, getting rid of the Queens. But it's still better for White. This position is still better for white. Um, but um, Fisher's continuation is crisp. He played knight e1. Uh, so there's no, you know, queen f4 here. It doesn't really do much. Because if we've got bishop takes f7, it's a forced mate in two, actually. Uh, check and mate. Uh, so uh, queen takes e1 check. King h2 and yeah it's a forced mate in seven this position apparently it's a forced mate in seven um, black played knight g5 which made it a mate in three uh, the mate in seven if black was um, wanting the longer one it's, it's like this uh, here check will do check Knight e8, and yeah, black is defenseless with these silly bishops outside of the game. There's no checks, um, yeah, apart from these ridiculous ones which the engine suggests. Whoops, yeah, so this is mating here with that knight e8, quite beautiful in that line. Um, so yeah, um, after king h2, black tried, well, he didn't take this. I mean, what else? He's getting slaughtered anyway, so he plays knight g5. After bishop takes f7, now black resigned. Uh, an example continuation here, where it's all mating two. It takes, say, 
uh, the main two is the check here. So if here we, we play this, and if king h8, we play knight takes f7. Yeah, the knight and queen work very well together. These silly bishops on a8 and a1. What an interesting position. But yeah, um, Fisher's game here strategy seems to be queen side then king side. It's a bit like, um, actually, it's a bit of a reflection of one of the, the famous 1972 games where he, he played on, on every side of the board. It's a bit of a symphony, uh, an orchestra orchestration on both sides of the board because you see the queen side was kind of tied up earlier and it looks as though you know all the play was on the queen side but uh, you know he forced this concession this 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 weak pawn here because it seems d5 was a big deal and then worked then later this backward c pawn black couldn't cope with it or black blunders i don't know i mean it does seem a bit odd if black didn't play this, I mean, the torture would just continue and continue if black didn't give up the C pawn. Um, as an example, I mean, let's, let's run through an engine line. Okay, bishop e7. I'm just going to put an engine line in. Could white actually um, do something? It might not come up with anything constructive, but you can see white's enjoying this position. Uh, might not be able to find anything conclusive, actually. We can maybe we can torture with knight e1. Actually, hold on a sec. Knight d3. Well, we can look at f4. If black does nothing, f4 might be under scrutiny. So, what do we do about this? We protect it. And then what? Maybe knight c5. And we look at this one. Uh, it's slow. I think it will be a a slow torture position I suspect but you know maybe nothing immediately conclusive it's just that the backward pawn black's not really going anywhere um, if if this ha happens we've got them b6 in the b file uh, I think then we can start to make progress maybe on this diagonal it gets weaker in these variations it's it's just a miserable position to play but um yeah i guess black could have black could have played on with this continuation sort of continuation it's just i'm just giving a fictional continuation if rook b7 uh wasn't played but it so it set off that turn of events for for losing a6 for b4 and then later we saw f4 so let's have a look at that again so Fisher wins that f4 pawn and he's around the king the thing is the queen has managed to get near the king uh, so it's like having a you know in in football a forward right near the goalkeeper so and it's just yeah bishop takes g6 smashes it all up with knight e1 yeah that was uh that was a good, good one, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, okay, one more. Uh, I'll try and do three each week at the moment. So one more uh, is against Minnick uh, in the next round, round 14. So Fisher was playing black. And funny enough, he'd used the Alakine defense now three times in this tournament. He did use it in the 1972 match. He plays it here, knight f6. You might associate Fisher with c5. But yeah, he played surprise openings like knight f6. Some speculation about this I was reading. Maybe he was trying to show to people that he wasn't all about just opening theory. You know, then he had a good, strong general middle game and end game. He didn't need tons of opening theory. It's a provocative, a weakness provocative opening, create, you know, creating weaknesses. Um, so white plays e5. So drag. Drago Lob Oh blimey. Dragolob Minic. Okay, so he, he advances his pawn. Yeah. Alakine uh defence. So C four. White resists F four. That would be going a bit crazy. White plays E takes a bit more solid. In fact, I suspect yeah, E takes is actually the most popular move here by a long shot. There's over two thousand three hundred games. 
F4 is much rarely, more rarely played, 667. Knight F3, 71. So E takes is the most common. And I think I've, I played uh, what F Fisher, what this, this one is what Fisher also plays against the Alakine defense. I think something like this, it's, it's a solid continuation for white. Knight C3 there, uh, just for those theoretically interested, is um, by far, by far, uh, the most common move. Uh, and this personally fascinates me because I think I've been incorrectly playing Knight F3 for many years. Uh, there's 900 games really, and you've got to ask why, with Knight C3, and only 47 with Knight F3. And you might think, well, they, they both like develop and help White Castle Kingside. Well, this one actually doesn't. But surely you want to get these bits out in Castle. I think the problem with Knight F3, it might be running into, um, no, not an immediate pin. Um, let's have a look. So if White plays, say, Bishop D3, then bishop g4, yeah? And we got pressure on d4 building up. Okay, anyway, knight c3 is the most common move. Um, if anyone really knows the reason for this, uh, yeah, just, just say. Um, okay, okay. Uh, after g6, again, this knight doesn't commit to f3. We see this knight staying there and white playing now bishop d3 uh, the most common move is actually bishop e3 again not touching these two pieces bishop e3 just supporting the d4 pawn is it actually the most common move so you might think this is a bit anti-intuitive but yeah d4 is a big concern here with things like this coming up if the knight did did go there i mean this is a big concern for d4 pressure uh, so white you know treads carefully um so apparently bishop e3 um, knight f3 is more rarely played um, but yeah we see bishop d3 bishop g7 and now knight g2 all together avoiding the pin we've always you know we've, we're keeping control of d4 here without the nuisance pin now black castles b3 and the engine lights white bit or not not particularly actually after b3 i'm not even sure if this is um b3 is not used that much actually it does intuitively it seems to weaken the diagonal a little bit i uh, usually players with white castle here uh, for example this position is apparently common where white reserves f3 and he's got d4 under control uh basically um so that that seems that seems reasonable but yeah, we see b3 uh, immediately. Not catastrophic at the moment. It's just a potential weakening on the diagonal. Knight c6, bishop e3. Okay, we seem to be transposing. But here it seems as though d5 is useful for black and technically gaining a small advantage with black, which is very, very rare. Um, th this is a nuisance move, d5. Uh, because e5 to follow up with is, is really piling on the pressure on the poor d4 pawn. Uh, white now, yeah, plays c5. Pardon me, c5. And we see knight d7. Uh, so the idea here is if knight takes d5, we can, we can actually just play knight takes c5. And this should be very nice for black, this position, already very nice for black. Um, and look at that diagonal. Ouch, and look at this. This is not very nice. Knight f4, queen e5. It's not, it's not nice at all, this position. If, if we move the rook, this, this looks unpleasant for white altogether. So yeah, um, so this, this is already a great position, a success for Fisher's Alakine defense, this position here. Uh, bishop b5 probably one of the best moves is played bishop b5 so white is trying uh potentially okay to to relieve the pressure on d4 by a radical exchange on c6 if needed 
but now Fischer intensifies the d4 pressure. He plays e5. White castles. And yeah, a, a, a very interesting move now. It seems um, this, there's a straightforward move here which would solve the d5 issue if that is an issue. Just for black to play a6, that's the engine suggestion, just for black to play a6 actually. Because uh, obviously we don't want this because that supports you know our center and everything. And that's beautiful for black. Uh, and if, if the bishop went back here, then e takes d4, ouch. Uh, that's, that can't be any good for white. And if the bishop went back here, then we can actually do what Fisher did in knight takes c5 uh, to get this d4 in. And this this is quite nice for black. Temporary peace sack. But Fisher actually played the temporary peace sack immediately. I mean, there's not much in it, actually. He plays this immediately to get this d4 in. So he's knocked out, um, and that isn't even taken. Hold on. White actually played d takes e5 here. Interesting position. d takes e5. If white, that's probably the best move actually. If white plays this, then d4, so we're getting the piece back, probably under favorable circumstances, one assumes. So d takes takes this looks grim I mean a little bit uh, this pawn in on e3 in particular so bishop h6 this this looks as though black's having a good time okay so um white took on e5 he ignored this uh, sack he just played d takes e5 but uh, now d4 was played uh, I think this is a very good move d4 uh, to take this pawn knight takes e5 so the center has been opened up there's no pawns in the center now um, and actually yeah it's it's apparently it's equal engine view it's equal this position uh, so all that central stuff has been um, resolved uh, the thing which looks a bit awkward, I mean, this bishop looked comfortable here, and this this, this doesn't look entirely convincing, this b3 pawn. But uh, anyway, so white plays h3, knight e6, knight takes, bishop takes. If anyone's better, slightly, it's black, it seems. Um, there's some pressure points here. c3 is a pressure point to queen a5. The bishop's not that comfortable on b5 here. I think white goes a bit crazy now at move 18. This looks intuitively as though it should be a terrible move. Um, Minnick actually played f I'm pretty sure the evaluation is going to drop massively in, into black's favour. Minnick played f4 and it does. Yeah, I was right. I don't know. We can't do this. Uh, we can't play f4. I think what is black threatening? Black might have been threatening queen a5. This this f4, does everyone agree f4 is not a move you'd ever want to play in this position as white? This this position technically here is is equal apparently. Uh the engine suggestion is um maybe just to take the to take the queens off and just accept maybe being tiny fractionally a bit worse but not moving the f pawn this position here uh shouldn't be such a big problem although it looks as though it's a little bit comfortable for black um you know two pawns on either side okay black could consider isolating it's not going to be a big deal to isolate that pawn but yeah white played this move f4 it just looks as though this is is asking for big trouble because um, we're kind of we're kind of weakening uh, this diagonal, and Fisher doesn't move this knight. If he moves this knight, um, then of course White can just take here maybe, and we've got a weak pawn here, and this justifies White's play. No, Fisher actually played Queen A5, so he's getting a small advantage from this. 
uh, if the knight moves now well the bishop's hanging as well and if rook c1 I think we've got some cheeky resources coming up or not yet I thought knight f3 maybe um, this one this is annoying queen e1 knight g4 this sort of stuff we can torture c3 so anyway this this looks as though it's going to be in black's favor so uh, f takes e5 was played queen takes c3 queen d4 queen a5 yes it looks as though e5 is a weak pawn a4 offering b3 that's taken uh, if the bishop had moved back I think we, we will we take on e5 and we've got that skewer now against the rook uh, embarrassingly we just played bishop takes e5 thanks very much skewer okay so a4 looks to be um yeah not very nice uh, on a6 here I think there's bishop d2 let's just check this a6 I think no not bishop d2 bishop d2 I don't think that works actually queen d8 all right but um b4 okay b4 okay so bishop takes b3 was played and yeah Fisher is now a pawn up he's converted that tiny advantage after f4 into a concrete pawn up bishop f4 trying to cling on to e5 a bit more a6 bishop e2 torturing now e5 next to be two pawns up potentially rook a3 bishop d5 uh, the bishop can sit comfortably here looking at that diagonal protecting b7 rook b1 bishop c6 indeed it does and also of course the queen has now got the influence on e5 uh, that could be handy pretty soon uh, yeah uh, even an exchange set could be quite powerful so bishop f3 was played second pawn up bishop takes e5 so a total success with the Alakine defense one tiny inaccuracy somewhere for white and he now finds himself two pawns down bishop takes rook takes um, bishop takes c6 b takes rook c3 can white get one pawn back or anything I don't think there's going to be enough time Fisher is now going for white's king next visit is the king these pawns can be used as positional sacrifices now for white to waste time trying to regain the pawn or two Fisher's looking at the king now with rookie two and the queen is ready to swing across to help the rook so this one's given up for a bit of time so rook takes c6 queen g5 immediately threatening mate queen g4 now this rook and pawn ending should Fisher keep the queens on or should he take the queens off he actually he does actually take the queens off I think this would have been fun as well potentially but he took took the queens off maybe saw this is the simplest thing to do because the rooks are very active after rook d8 he's going to bring the rooks down to the seventh uh, so he's got another rook and pawn ending here g5 okay so g5 he actually he plays rook d5 to go this route to pick up a pawn if he went immediately with rook d2 um yeah this is good as well but yeah he wanted to pick up a pawn on route and get rid of this clamp uh, which could be useful for restricting the king later to get rid of this pawn is is, is seems sensible uh, so king f1 this one okay so he's a pawn up but with g2 it's going to be under scrutiny surely with rook d2 so rook b2 defending against rook d2 check 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 rook a3 uh, we see rook a7 h5 here king g7 yeah black's better is it going to be another grind uh, long grind king h6 rook f1 um this this seems a bit the thesis actually but I, I don't know if there's anything better um if black's given time well okay white white went with rook f1 that was taken and after f5 
Rook A8. Uh, white, I, I think, may have resigned with this move unless he lost on time. It's at move 45. White seemed to resign with Rook A8. Um, let's, let's have a look at an example continuation. If H4, A5, King G5, A6, there's no checks for the king here. So King G4, we can get closer here. If we go with this G5, and now the rook is stuck. Any any move of the rook, we're going to lose A7. There's no checks. So let's play this. King F4, which means now that we're going to drive the king back. Uh, let's say like this. King G3 is actually threatening mate. So this position just gets worse and worse, I think, for white. Yeah, he's going to lose g2 next uh, or get mated. So yeah, he, he resigns um, around about here. After, after this here, f5, he, he just resigned. Uh, we can have a look at this game in in um, summary. Let's have a look. An Alakine defense. So who thought the Alakine defense was that bad an opening? He used it three times in this tournament. We've, and um, yeah. So one slight weakness. And it seems black had a great game here. Uh, so this knight d7 really interesting move. Uh, so here if knight takes d5, there will be knight takes c5 in response. So we see this e5 is taking. Yeah, black got a tiny advantage, but I think f4 didn't really help uh, the position at all. Maybe queen a5, the strength of queen a5 was overlooked. So after that, yeah, white sort of lost a pawn, then another pawn. Fisher gave back a pawn, but then he had a winning rook and pawn ending. Yeah, he was content with this, this rook and pawn ending being winning. Okay, um, Okay, I hope you got something from that. Um, I think I'll be streaming next week on Tuesday at the same time, so 8 p.m. Uh, London time next Tuesday. So, yeah, any comments or questions on YouTube? Okay, thanks very much. Okay, see you next week. Have a good week. Okay.